Election College, Episode 11, The War of 1812. Let's throw a political party. Face it, the political scene sucks, but did it always? It's time for Election College, and class is in session. Now, your hosts, Jason Goff and Ben Smith. Hey everybody, I'm Ben Smith. And I'm Jason Goff. And today we're going to talk about the War of 1812 and the burning of Washington. Let's get into it. Hey, Jason, I just want to let you know, I just want to let you know we're going to talk about the War of 1812 today. Is that all right with you? Yeah, that sounds cool. That was a good year, right? Yeah, it was a good year of wine, too, um, especially hmm. from what I understand. Good Man, year. I wonder how much a bottle of wine from 1812 would cost. <laughs> Probably like a expensive. gazillion and a half dollars. Yeah, pretty much. So, yeah, we're going to skip, uh, well, not skip, but we're going to not talk about an election today. Is that all? Is that all right? Are we, I mean, we're election college. Can we do that? Well, we did that last time, so you can always go back to episode 10. True. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. But uh, the War of 1812 really does have a lot of stuff that influences elections and future elections and future presidents and territories. And, man, it's just packed full to the brim. Yeah, it's it really has an impact on how we see ourselves, how we see Canada, how Canada sees us. How British see British, <laughs> how Great Britain sees us, and France and Spain, and Native Americans. It's got all kinds of implications. Absolutely. And just a heads up to everyone who's gonna listen here and then freak out at one point because we didn't mention their famous, their favorite name or their favorite battle or city or something like that. Some some battle that took place. We're not going to be able to hit it all because we try and keep this show short, but we will hit as many high points as possible. Yeah, so in episode nine, we talked a bit about the Embargo Act and how Britain and France wouldn't let the U.S. trade with one another. And then in episode 10, we talked about the election of 1812 a little bit. Um, we skirted around the issue of the War of 1812, but we didn't quite get into it as much as we're going to here. Yeah, so to recap, the British had continued impressing the U.S. men, the sailors, and they still wouldn't really cooperate with either the U.S. or France. Right, and once again, if we have to explain it again, because you keep asking, impressing is basically kidnapping soldiers or any really body on a ship that you feel like and making them work in your Navy for you, so... We didn't like that as the United States, and the British were like, we're going to do it because we can. And also, some of these guys are probably ours, and some of them probably deserted you. So, you know, it became a thing. Yeah, it was kind of hard to differentiate to the nationality because some of these guys, I mean, I, I don't know what their accent was like, but some of these guys would have been British citizens who sided with the U.S. and became naturalized citizens. There's a lot that we could get into that we're just not going to. Just know that the British were essentially kidnapping our people. I heard somebody describe it as fancy kidnapping, <laughs> which I thought was pretty accurate. It's pretty impressive. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. There is some controversy, by the way, and I don't know if this is strictly modern-day interpretation or if it was around at the time, but there's some controversy about how many people were actually impressed, and some people say anywhere from a few hundred and other people say upwards of 6,000, which is quite a big disparity. And there's a lot of people who accuse Madison and others at the time of exaggerating the numbers so that more people would be in favor of going to war. All you need to know is that for sure, the issue of impressment was used as a reason to go to war, for sure. Yeah. So do you want to talk about the Embargo Act? Yeah, let's talk about it just a little bit. So the Embargo Act was withdrawn in 1809, and it was replaced with the Non-Intercourse Act which specifically prohibited trade with France or Britain. And just like the Embargo Act, the Non-Intercourse Act was also unsuccessful. And they replaced it with a bill stating that if either Britain or France would drop trade restrictions with the U.S., Congress would drop trade restrictions against that country as well. Seems pretty legit, right? Yeah. And so Napoleon said he would stop restrictions, and James Madison, our distinguished 
short president, blocked all trade with Britain, and he said that trade with France would be resumed. So not everybody is all hunky-dory with the British. Obviously, there's lots of stuff going on. And Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun um, had become to, had begun to advocate for war against the British. Kind of extreme, right? Like, okay, well, I know there's some disagreement, but war already? Yeah, it's pretty we just, strong. We just got, yeah, we got freed up from them. And so they're like, hey, they're violating our maritime rights. They are encouraging the Native Americans to be hostile towards us as we're trying to expand into the West. Let's go to war. Come on. Come on, James. Yeah. So in June of 1812, President Madison sends a message over to Congress. He says, hey, these are our grievances against Great Britain. But he didn't specifically call for war at that point. And the House of Representatives were like, hey, let's get together in secret and talk. And we'll talk for like four days and then we'll vote whether or not we want to go to war. So they got together for like four days and they talked. And then they voted 79 to 49 in favor of going to war. And so on to the other side of the Capitol building. The Senate agreed by 19 to 13 to vote in favor of war. I'd say President Madison probably had a pretty good idea what was going to happen when he sent that letter to Congress. But he definitely knew at this point. And he officially, along with Congress, proclaims war and signs it into effect the next day on June 18th, 1812. Yeah, and keep in mind, so this is an election year, and the Federalists are big time going to go against anything that Madison is about. So all 39 Federalists, and this sounds like a partisan vote to me, all 39 Federalists voted against the war, and they started calling it Mr. Madison's War. Many of the people who were against the war were actually from the Northeast. And in the Northeast, there was a lot of commerce with Canada. And of course, who owned Canada but Britain? And so, you know, you have war, you interrupt trade, you disrupt normal life in Northeast. So a lot of the Federalists just were not about to have it. Yeah. And so Madison and everyone who sided with him really wanted to strike first and immediately go after Canada, which, as you said, was a British colony after the formal declaration. So the American officials were, they were overly optimistic about invasion, and the U.S. troops were not very well prepared. And keep in mind that their the military was really small at this point, and there was no formal, huge military operation. So these were mainly militiamen. Yeah, I, I saw a lot of people um, commenting and saying online that this war, the War of 1812, is really when the U.S. decided, oh, I guess we need to formalize the military more so. Because at this point, the regular army consisted of less than 12,000 men, and that's even four times as big as it was back in yeah. Jefferson's day, just a few years back. And then... At that point, Congress authorizes the army to be expanded to 35,000 men, which, if you can imagine, 35,000 isn't still a whole lot, but compared to 12,000 and then compared to even to 3,000 in a matter of like 10 or 15 years, just huge expansion in the military. Yeah, and keep in mind that joining the military at this point was voluntary, was voluntary and it was really unpopular because of the poor pay and the lack of training. And much of the militia objected to serving outside their home states, and they refused any sort of discipline and were altogether not that good at fighting. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we talk about how it was um, how it was kind of unpopular, and I mean, you've seen the movies, right? You know how they used to war with each other. They just stood there and shot at each other. I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> right. be too keen on it either. Like, at least let me stick behind a, a bunker or something. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. So, hey, Ben, did you ever see that movie Canadian Bacon? I've I've uh, seen bits and pieces of it, but I've never seen the full thing. It is an awesome movie, and I don't even know where you can get it at this point. Ever since Blockbuster closed, I don't even know what to do. Have but, you seen a movie since Blockbuster closed, Jason? That's a very good question. Have I seen a movie since Blockbuster closed? Well, I've got an 18-month-old kid, so no, of course not. Oh. What are you talking about? <laughs> All right, then. Well, huh. so anyway, what about Canadian bacon? Basically, the Cold War is over. 
and Alan Alda is president, and John Candy is the mayor of Niagara Falls, New York, and we invade Canada. And I think that might have been what Madison was thinking. Hey, let's yeah, it's pretty much pretty much the same thing. And did you ever wonder about the whole bacon thing? Like in Canada, their bacon is completely different than ours. It's true, and I don't really know that that's fair to them. Yeah, why can't bacon just be bacon? Nonetheless, the U.S. was not really prepared for a war. And part of that reason was because of lack of bacon. I mean, sorry. Yeah. Um, Madison actually hoped that the U.S. troops would easily win in Canada and then that maybe the British would just be like, oh, we, you guys are serious. Okay, well, let's negotiate. Oh, and I just remembered about Canadian bacon. I have to mention this, that Stephen Wright, the comedian, is a Mountie. And he's got that really dry sense of humor. Just go out, get Canadian bacon. Um, <laughs> you need to watch that. But but anyway, w- war was not terribly popular at this point. And there were members of Congress who were publicly insulted and kicked <laughs> through their towns. And private bankers would not help finance the war since they were all almost opposed to it. And... What are the guys in New England doing? They're saying, let's secede. Sound like a good idea? Yeah. I mean, when things get rough, let's either call someone um, treasonous or secede from the Union. Either way, uh, we're American, and that's what we do. Yeah. So the British, of course, are hearing this, and they're like, you guys are not unified. We are going to go over there and defeat you and just rip you to shreds. So the U.S. actually faced a better defense than they were expecting. And on August 16th, the United States suffered a humiliating defeat where they were chased and scared uh, away by the British. And they were tricked, or not really tricked, but they were scared into surrendering. And not even a single shot was fired. So, I mean, come on, United States. Have have some guts. But, yeah, they got their butts kicked a few times. Yeah, so we won't go into all the details about the battles that took place, but these few things are pretty important to know at this point. The British won battles more often than the Americans did, but the U.S. did win some bigger battles that actually helped things go in their favor. And the war actually had a lot of naval components to it, and and some people even consider this primarily a naval war. Um, There were a lot of stuff on the land, of course, but... Um, The big stuff happened in the Atlantic and in multiple lakes, including Lake Erie and other Great Lakes, and then even some battles in the Gulf. And yeah, so it's a lot of of boat action. And both sides actually recruited and used Native Americans, whoever was going to be to their advantage. So many of the Native Americans were, were thinking, who is going to give us the best opportunity to keep some land? Right, and sadly, as we'll learn, no one gave them a good opportunity to keep their land. Yeah. So during this time, you know that the Napoleonic Wars are going on in Europe, and Napoleon is defeated in 1814. And so the Brits are like, hey, uh, we had what we could probably say some of the best soldiers in the world we're fighting in Europe, and now they're not anymore. So let's they're freed up. Let's send them over to fight the United States. Yeah. So leadership, the British leadership is thinking, that is a great idea. Meanwhile, the citizens in Great Britain are thinking, huh? What in the world are you doing? We don't have that much money left over. And it, it's it's actually kind of an afterthought over there. But there wasn't any or very little desire on the part of the British to seize American ships or sailors. So right there, there were two reasons that they were fighting that no longer existed even. So yeah, it's kind of funny. They're they're fighting against Napoleon and they're like, hey, we need more ships and sailors. So they start taking them off the U.S. And then after they beat Napoleon, they're like, all right, now let's go fight the U.S. to get more ships and sailors to fight Napoleon. Oh. Oh, so, so like, why are we, why are we fighting? <laughs> right. So 
the British, they get to Bladensburg, Maryland, and they win a battle there, which allowed them to continue towards Washington. And President James Madison and some other government officials got word that the troops were coming, and they flee to Brookville, Maryland. And actually, Brookville, Maryland, if you Google Brookville, Maryland, they go by the title of United States Capitol for a day. So, you know, it was a nice little time they had there, a little bit of glory. Yeah. Claim to fame. That's pretty big. My town has never been the capital of anything. Let's go back in time and picture what Washington, D.C. was like in 1812. Pretty impressive, right? It's, well, actually, no. Not really at all. Mm -mm. Really, the Capitol building was the only nice building in Washington. It, It was the only thing really worth seeing. So what did the British try to do? Burn it down. And that's very symbolic, of course. So they go over, they loot the Capitol first and try to burn it. But the Capitol is made of stone. So (laughs) so get this. They're like, uh, somebody get the furniture. (laughs) So they they pile it up and light it on fire with rocket powder. I didn't know they had rockets back then. Yeah, there's rockets red glaring at some point during the war. Like like the... The shuttles, like the space shuttles, the rockets, they send in the... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. During the burning of the Capitol, the entire Library of Congress, which at that time was 3,000 volumes. It is many more volumes now, by the way. Uh, It was destroyed. And then after the war, our buddy Thomas Jefferson, remember him? He actually sold his personal library to the government in order to pay off some personal debts, which then... They turned into the Library of Congress, and it continued to grow from there. So after the whole furniture in the Capitol building and lighting it on fire with rockets and so on, the British, they head down Constitution Avenue, and there's where the president lives. And it's the building now known as the White House. They burn it down. I think it was called the Executive Mansion at that point. And... They added a little extra fuel on it so it would burn even longer as a symbol. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, retaliation going on here because the Americans had burned down some places in Canada that were really symbolic and important to the Brits. And the Brits were like, what can we do to get back at them? Let's burn down the Capitol. And also, that'll really get them. Ha. Back over to the executive mansion legend has it that dolly madison you remember her i do remember her pastries and yeah so she got a letter from her hubby james and he told her hey dolly be prepared to leave washington because at a moment's notice you might need to go so she gathered up their slaves and the staff to save all the valuables and she got out her exacto knife and this is not a paid endorsement of Exacto, but she got out the knife and she cut the portrait of Washington out of its frame and saved it. So, hooray, Dally. Yeah, it's a great story, except someone has disputed it. Oh, well, let's just pretend that's true, okay? Oh, well, I mean, should I even... Please? Should... Go ahead. Okay, okay. Buzz According kill. to the personal slave of James Madison, that feels so weird to say, the personal slave. Anyway, I that know. was what was going on. Uh, Paul Jennings, who was 15 at the time, said uh, he published some memoirs after uh, James Madison died, and he bought his freedom from Dolly Madison. He published in his memoirs that Dolly wouldn't have even had time to take it down, and it would have required a ladder to take it down. And actually, all she carried away was her personal silver. And in reality, it was the doorkeeper and the president's gardener that saved the picture of George Washington or the photo or, I mean, not photo, portrait. And then they also got some other valuables and some nice stuff that they took and saved with them, too. So, yay, doorkeeper. Yay, gardener. You're awesome. Yay, Dolly Madison, because we're going to still pretend it was you. Yeah, so the British troops that did all of this were basically denounced and told that it was senseless vandalism. Which you could say it was. There wasn't really a reason to do it, but why not? And then there's a lot of people in Congress who now that everything's burned down, you know, you've got this whole north-south thing going on. They want to relocate the capital north of the Mason-Dixon line. And there's actually a good bit of support for it. But ultimately, a bill was defeated in Congress that would have allowed that to happen. 
So they just rebuilt the capital where it was. Sounds good to me. So the war ended when each side realized that the things that they were fighting for had basically taken care of themselves. And it really was a stalemate at this point with the U.S. winning many naval battles, but Britain was continually winning on land. Right. So we have the Treaty of Ghent on December 24th, 1814. It calls for a cessation of hostilities. It calls for an exchange of land and prisoners. And there's actually a joint commission uh, that's put together to study the United States and Canada boundary issues. And so they're like, hey, war's over. No problem. We're done. Everybody's going to live from now on. Yeah. What was that date that you said for the Treaty of Ghent? Uh, December 24th, 1814. And guess what? 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 what the what? servers were down and that was all happening in Europe, right? Okay. Yeah. And it didn't get transmitted over the satellite. And they still fought the Battle of New Orleans on January 8th of 1815. So whether or not it would have changed anything, if they would have had the internet back then and they said, hey, Treaty of Ghent, this is great, the war is over, we're at peace, the case could be made that the Battle of New Orleans was necessary. So anyway, we get to that in just a moment. The... Battle was fought. It was a lopsided victory for the Americans. General Andrew Jackson, he helped win the battle. It escalated him to a position where he could become the eventual president. The British suffered about 2,000 casualties in this uh, in this battle, which is approximately a fourth of the total casualties they had. And uh, actually, Edward Pakenham, the commanding general, uh, was killed here as well. And so, yeah, we call this the second ending to the War of 1812, um, but it really continued a little bit after this because, you know, there's some more naval battles that happen after the Battle of New Orleans. And if you didn't notice, you know, if you're out in the middle of the ocean and your satellite dish isn't working correctly, it's hard to get news to you. So you see an enemy ship, you just shoot it, and that's how people continue to die after a treaty is made. The Battle of New Orleans really was a huge morale booster for the Americans. And nationalism grew, and Americans were really proud to be Americans. And hey, it's all good, right, Ben? Uh, I'm pretty impressed with it myself. It's funny because if you read different accounts of it, different countries tell the story differently. And even different parts of our country uh, at the time, told the story differently, which probably is the case for anything. But there's one guy. Um, I know he said we weren't going to get into a lot of specific battles and everything, but there's this one guy who was at uh, Fort McHenry. His mm -hmm. name was Francis Scott Key. Have you heard of him? Yeah, he was a lawyer guy from Maryland. On September 13th, 1814, he wrote a poem called The Defense of Fort McHenry. And it kind of goes a little something like this. O oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. And the poem goes on, talks about rockets' red glare and the bombs bursting in air. And like with any good poem, it's later set to a British drinking song. What's better for the national anthem of the United States than a British tune, right? Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, I love it. So yeah, Francis Scott Key did get the inspiration for a poem that eventually became our national anthem during a battle that happened at Fort McHenry. Lots of cool stuff, and lots of really not cool stuff also happened during the War of 1812, but it did define us as a nation for sure. You know what's crazy, Ben? What's that? So the 200th anniversary of the War of 1812, it's just a few okay. years behind us, right? Right. And in the States, there wasn't really that much commemoration of it. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean... um, Actually, just the other day, I was driving down the highway, and I saw somebody from Maryland. They had a license plate that was a War of 1812 license plate. But other than that, I haven't seen that much in the States to commemorate this very important war. Have you seen much elsewhere? Well, I've heard that in Canada, especially in Ontario, that they've had – that they did several events to commemorate the battle and – um, the various battles that were fought there. So 
it was pretty important to Canada. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the one thing I do want to go back to, I mentioned this in episode 10 and briefly here in this episode as well. So nobody, nobody that you think of often, unfortunately, uh, really loses any land or any real big deal except for the Native Americans, the Indians. Yeah. Um, they lost a lot of land during this war. They gave up a lot of land to let each side build forts and everything on. And when we're done, we're like, oh, no, 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 go ahead. Uh, this is ours now. You can go ahead somewhere else. And so this is just the beginning. Uh, well, not even the beginning. This is another part that starts off the kind of sliding and persecution, I could I should almost say, of the Native Americans. And I'm sure we will get into that further as we go forward in history. When we ask the question, who won the War of 1812, that's pretty difficult to answer. But when you ask the question, who lost the War of 1812, the answer is pretty clear. Absolutely. I uh, wanted to let everybody know, if you want to learn more about the War of 1812, there is a book called The Civil War of 1812. And it goes into lots of different facets and different sides and seeing it from all different viewpoints. Uh, It is available on Amazon as well as Audible. If you go to to electioncollege.com slash Audible, you can get a free trial and a free audio book. And if you like to hear more about the War of 1812, check out Civil War of 1812, American Citizens, British Subjects, Irish Rebels, and Indian Allies. And I think you'll like it. Got anything else, Ben? I just want to let everybody know to check out electioncollege.com. We have lots of stuff for them to read and see and smell and, well, probably not smell, but you know where I'm going. (laughs) Hey, and we're all about the social media. We are on Twitter at Election College. We are Facebooking it up at facebook.com slash election college. And hey, we, thanks to our friends over at Canva, throw some pretty cool stuff up on Instagram. And every now and then, we hang out on Periscope. So follow us there. Once again, if you like what you hear, leave us a review on iTunes at electioncollege.com slash iTunes. It really, really does help. There are lots of statistics that prove how far ahead it boosts you. And it is only because of people who have already left reviews that I think we're in the place we are. Yeah. So we are forever grateful to all of you who have left and who will leave a review there in iTunes. All right. Well, that's the War of 1812, and I am Ben. And I'm Jason. Thank you very much for listening. We'll see you next time.